Steve Bowers welcoming you to a very special Studio 6 here at E Plus TV 6 with uh, Willie X Evans and another edition of Nashville and Parts Unknown. And Willie, looks as if you're at the Legends of Tennessee Music Museum right here in Jackson. I am. Legends of Tennessee. <laughs> the by, by the way, the Mark museum Rock. is open. Oh, you got, your, you got your Hard Rock Jackson shirt. You no, know, there was a whole big story about how you know th th they wanted to sell hard rock cafe shirts and, and they weren't allowed to because we're not a hard rock cafe, obviously, anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, but then uh, Tiger called them and, and said, Hey, it's okay with me and it should be okay with y'all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this is the only place in the world you get a hard rock Jackson uh, t shirt is uh, at the uh, Legends of Tennessee Music Museum on College Street. It's open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, and they've improved the tour and got host there and everything else. So it's a, it's a great showcase of Jackson and West Tennessee music. And really glad to see you there. And that, that banner, that Hard Rock Cafe banner was the original banner at the original Hard Rock Cafe in the United States. First one in the US was here in Jackson. And so found that one. And that, that's an extraordinary piece of memorabilia there. That's right. At the old Hickory Mall. You yeah. just Remember ride down well. the little, well. little corner. Well, Will, it's good to, good to be visiting with you. And you got a very special guest. How did, how did you meet our guest? today well actually steve i've just been to hear him play a bunch and but uh about and i was telling carl this before we got on this uh recording here that uh, uh dave mallard and i went down there about seven or eight years ago so i know he's been playing there seven or eight years you can go hear him anytime at the station in oh, at the station in okay on Mondays, he said, except December, he's taking a break in December. But uh, any time after that, on Mondays with Val Story and Larry Cordell. Uh, but the best place I remember him from is growing up watching the Glenn Campbell show and that banjo player. <laughs> That's the dude. <laughs> and here he is with us today. All these years later, we're talking about Carl Jackson. Carl, it's good to see you. It's good to see you guys too. I'm glad yeah, to really, be here. Really, really appreciate that. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you know, it. You worked with Glenn for how many years? Well, uh, some people say I did, but I don't. Know, this this guy here worked with him from <laughs> 1972 to 1984, and some people tell me that's me, but I don't know. I, okay, that, I, I look at it now. I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> you know, well, one, one thing I know, you know, the Glenn Campbell show. Anytime they brought somebody up, the banjo man, you were the man was there. You know, they didn't have anybody well, else, that's for sure. You know, uh, when Glenn's uh, Good Time Hour went on the air, the, actually, the, the first banjo player there was John Hartford. If you oh, remember. is that right? Okay. And then Larry McNeely followed him. I took Larry McNeely's place in 1972, and uh, I went to work with Glenn and stayed with him out on the road for 12 wonderful years. He's just the greatest. He featured me on every show that he did all over the world, and he was so good to me, made such a difference in my life continued to bless me even after you know after i left the road with glenn we remained okay. close friends I, I wound up producing his very last studio album and, oh is that right okay yeah yeah the, the, his, uh, adios what was, was it? adios adios, adios. Yeah. adios. Yeah. wow okay yeah i produced that album and uh and glenn's uh his daughter ashley she's my goddaughter so we I mean, uh, glenn's family you know okay. and i wow. miss him miss him very very much how, what was that experience like knowing that that's the last album? Well, uh, a lot of people have asked me that question. And, um, you know, I, most people, they, they think it was a really, really hard job. You know, Glenn was suffering from Alzheimer's. And uh, I, I can't say that there weren't moments that weren't a bit difficult. But overall, it was just absolutely one of the most wonderful experiences okay. of my life. Okay. To be able to work with him at the end there like that. Uh, he still, he, his pitch was still perfect. He was incredible. Such an, he was the greatest singer I've ever heard in my life. And uh, he had Alzheimer's. I had to print out the lyrics. We had to sometimes do a line at a time, but uh, he just couldn't remember lyrics. He didn't have any problem with melodies. He didn't have any problem with pitch. He was, he was amazing. And it was wow. a total, we, we laughed a lot more than we cried. Believe okay. me, it was a total joy. Well, this I was intrigued. And did you see this special that they did with Tony Bennett with Lady Gaga the other night? I, I haven't seen that yet. And, I want, and, I want to. and it, 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 cause when they interview him, you, you can tell that there are issues, but, but, uh, but Carl, when, 
when they got on that state course, you know, this big band, this is jazz syncopation. I mean, this is intricate stuff. And I mean, without yeah. a note or yeah. whatever, it was like he he was there. He, he yeah. He, he, it was just, and I, the human mind is a mysterious thing, isn't it? It, it is. That's, and that's the way Glenn was. He was, uh, he couldn't remember lyrics at all, oh, okay. but he could get on stage with a teleprompter and just, just kill it. You right know? <laughs> wow. And his, uh, you know, that was one of the last things to go was his musical ability. Ability, you know? okay. It, uh, yeah. Did you work with him on that last tour or was it just the album? No, just the album. Okay. Uh, you know, I didn't. I, when I left in 1984, I didn't tour with Glenn anymore after that. But we worked together through the years, and of course, remained very, very close through the years. Uh, Glenn was on the the Lubin Brother project that I produced years ago. Oh, he, okay. He did, uh, he did when I stopped dreaming with Leslie Satcher on that uh, Living, Loving, Losing songs of the Lubin Brothers record, and and we. Paul Jackson's we stayed, with us. Your life started in Mississippi. You were telling. It did. I'm from Louisville, Mississippi. A little so they town. say Louisville, not Louisville. They say Louisville. That's right. We, we got to pronounce our S's in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you got to. <laughs> you can't get around that. So okay. it's it's a little town, north central Mississippi. It's about uh, it's about 25 miles from Mississippi State. Yeah. Okay. Old Miss, Old Miss is okay. arch rival, which by the okay. way we yeah. we won in the Egg Bowl again. I just remind all the state fans of that. You know. uh, and uh but um, i'm a big old miss fan and uh but that's a little strange i guess growing up in louisville since we're so close to mississippi close state to mississippi. So to Star but, okay. yeah close to start but uh but that's okay i love my rebels <laughs> how did uh how did music start with you then Carl? music started my, my uh my dad uh, and my two uncles my uncle pete and my uncle burgess my uncle, uncle socks how i knew him that was his nickname uh, they had a little country band or a little bluegrass band called the Country Partners. And uh, I just had the urge to play. My uncle started taking some lessons from banjo lessons from a guy named Bud Rose, who was a great banjo player and a great musician, great singer. He worked with Carl Sausman and the Green Valley Boys over in Aliceville, Alabama. And when he started taking lessons with Bud, I decided I wanted to take some lessons. I wanted to learn to play. And I was, I was about eight years old. I wound up taking two or three lessons in person from Bud, and then Bud moved back to to East Tennessee area, and so then he he would send me some reel to reel tapes, you know, <laughs> some other things. But mostly oh. then I, I learned from just sitting in front of a record player and okay. listening to the slowing yeah. down records of Earl Scruggs and Alan Shelton yeah. and Don yeah. Reno and all the great. Was, was it always the banjo? Was that your instrument from the very beginning? That's that's what I started on. I I didn't play guitar until later. Uh, I got really, really interested in guitar playing uh, because of uh, one particular record that my dad uh, picked up one day. He picked up a record uh, called Nashville Underground it was by a guy named Jerry Reed. Jerry Reed, yes. I played that and on that, radio in 68. Phenomenal. Yeah, that absolutely blew me away. And then, of course, I got into Chet Atkins very much. I loved, okay. loved Chet so much. Yeah. Uh, he was such a good man, such a great player. Those two guys were a big influence on me as okay. a guitar player. I remember buying a, I bought a little gut strain guitar at, Mer, I believe it was, I think it was Morris Music or Morrell Music or something like that down in Valdosta, Georgia. A little, a little Martin gut string. And I, every, you know, everywhere I'd go with Jim and Jesse, I'd have that little guitar out, okay. uh, you know, wow. learning that Jerry Reed stuff. Uh, John Henry was a steel driving man. I still remember that off that album. Oh, man, it was a great version. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great it, version. It's amazing. Carl Jackson's with us. We mentioned Jim and Jesse. And that's where we're going to pick up this story. Stay right where you are. We're back with more as we continue this very special Nashville and Parts Unknown with Carl Jackson on Studio Six. Welcome back to this Nashville Parts Unknown edition of Dialogue here at E Plus TV Six. We're visiting with Carl Jackson, Willie X Evans. Who is set up at the Legends of Tennessee Music Museum here in Jackson? Help set this help set this up. Now, it, Willie, they're talking about uh, that uh, that Jerry Reed Nashville Underground. Did you hear that album back in the days? I did. I, it was way ahead of its time, wasn't it? I mean, when I heard guys, that thing, it was like, wow, guys, there, there weren't many people doing this kind of stuff. Uh, -uh. these guys live. He, he had kind of a funky feel to country music, and <laughs> it was kind of like I don't know what this man's doing, but it. Uh, you know, Wayland had hit a little bit. I mean, late sixties it began to change a bit, but it was it was ahead of its time. I think uh, he was he was amazing. Yeah, 
there was another one too. I, I think his, his, his first album actually was, I think the, is it the amazing guitar and voice of Jerry oh, Reed or something oh, like okay, that? Okay, Jerry Reed. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. a, I think that was the first one. Uh, but uh, that Nashville Underground was the first one I picked up. And yeah. oh, man, it, was it was just like, amazing. There's something there's something different happening here. And then Waylon hit with the only daddy that'll walk the line. And suddenly, because I know the program guys, I was working WHOS in Decatur, and those were country guys, and they they weren't really sure about all, all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, Loretta Lynn and all this other stuff. That's what we know. And it's, it's moving in a different, in, in a different direction. And, and so. no, one, of the, one of the great thrills of my, uh, my career was uh, when Glenn was doing his, his second TV show, uh, just called uh, the Glenn Campbell Show, I believe is what it was called. Anyway, we filmed, we filmed those and Jerry was a guest on one of them. And uh, oh, okay. we, sat there, we sat there and played uh, a thing called Love Together. Okay. Uh, me and Jerry together and Glenn sang it. It was just a, that's a, that's a video that I treasure, you know, oh, very much. Cause we're sitting there with two heroes, you know? Yeah. To, to be able to, to be able to do you that. learn any licks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I learned a lot of licks from both of them. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, you mentioned Absolutely. Jim and Jesse. How did you get involved with them? Cause that, people that, that are our age will remember them. Many will not. They'll say, who is that now? Uh, well, they're they're uh, bluegrass icons. Is, yeah, is they, are. they are. Absolutely, uh, Jesse's one of the greatest mandolin players of all time. Fine singer, and Jim McReynolds is one of the greatest tenor singers of all time. And, and to be able to to land a job with them at, at fourteen was was you were amazing. I mean, it was, yeah, I was fourteen. Uh, my dad had, had taken me to a show. I was probably around twelve, I guess. Uh, they came down to a little place called Reform, Mississippi. I believe that's the first place I saw them. Okay. It was either there or Zama, Mississippi. They came and played a little schoolhouse there when I was about okay. 12 years old. It was on a Saturday night. I didn't want to go because Ole Miss was playing football. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to stay home and listen to it on the radio. But Daddy made me go. And uh, when he did, you know, once we got there, I was real I was real glad. And okay. It was a uh, – wasn't a whole lot of security around it, you know what I mean? So uh, on, the, on the intermission, we um, we just walked backstage to uh, to meet them. And, uh, you know, Daddy introduced himself, and then he introduced them to me, told them I played. And they wanted to hear me play, of course. And so I got my banjo and played a couple of things for them. And, uh, so you walked back there out. with a banjo? You walked with a banjo back there? Back well, backstage. I mean, we had, it, we had it with us, you know, and they wanted to hear me. So... <laughs> And uh, so they brought me out on the second set, you know, on, after intermission, they brought me out and had me play wow. a tune or two with them. And, uh, and wow. then, and then my dad told them, Hey, if you guys ever, of course, Alan, Alan Shelton was still with them then, you know, yeah. said, but if you guys ever need a, a banjo player, you know, at some point in ever in the future, please keep us in mind. And, you know, a couple of years later, Alan had decided to move on or whatever. And I think, I think, I think maybe Vic Jordan had played with them some already. I can't, remember but anyway uh we got a call from from jim mcreynolds and he wanted to know if uh, if my mom and dad would let me go out on the road with the them road. in the summers you know when i was uh, out of school and i had a great principal also who let me uh he told me as long as i keep my grades up i could go anytime i wanted to want to wow so uh i i'd go out on weekends with them and and during the full summer and and uh, so that was the first you know pro gig i had was with them and they were just and you were 14 I was 14, yeah. How long did you stay with them? I stayed with them until I was, um, gosh, I guess, well, I did, a, I, I guess I had to break it down. You know, I, a lot of times I'd say I, I stayed with them five years. It, I, when I'm looking back on it, I don't think it was a total of five years. I don't okay. know, uh, but I went, because I played about probably a little less than a year with the Sullivan family after I left Jim and Jesse. And then I went with Glenn Campbell after okay. that. Okay. And uh, well, there, there was a uh, there was a week long stint with the country store in there also with Keith Whitley and Jimmy oh. Goodrow and okay, Bill wow. Rollins that we formed the country store and it's a long story and it sounds like I'm shortening it there but uh, Glenn hired me I was still 18 when Glenn hired me okay uh, so you, you total all that up in a period of about four years or so you know I was with Glenn and I, it was he hired me right before I turned 19 so okay. that's usually why I say but all that's great I had short stints in there with the Sullivan family okay. and uh, then the well, country store what when you when you were Jim and Jesse in those days what were the venues you talk about hearing them at a school I mean heard Sonny James would come to our high school to play I mean yeah. people think now you know when they think country music, they think concert halls and and I remember talking to W.S. Holland here you know who drummed with Johnny Cash he yeah. said well they had that 
throw some live album. He said, you know, he said, suddenly we're playing Cobo Hall in Detroit, but he said, before that, we were, we were just playing. Yeah. You know, where you could play, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that was a, a wonderful learning experience. And once again, so blessed to be, to, to land a job with just two of the finest people I've ever known, Jesse and, you know, Jim and Jesse were just so good to me. And, and, uh, and, I, you know, God just put me in the right place at the right, right. time. I mean, they, so, they were so really, when, really good people. When you're being on the road and, and where, I mean, that, that's the professional side of this. If you're on the road, I mean, that's that travel and do this every night kind of thing out there. And that has to be an acquired skill almost or placing in your life to do that. Yeah, it it does, but I, I guess when you're that, you know, at 14 years old, you just kind of <laughs> just kind of fall into it. Yeah, beats you, going to school, doesn't it? It beats going to school. I can tell you that. A lot, you're, when you're going to bluegrass school, is a lot more fun than regular yeah. school. You mentioned yeah. also you dropped the name Keith Whitley in there. How how were you involved with him? Well, Keith and I became friends out on the road. Of course, uh, you know Keith was working with Ralph, Ralph okay. Stanley, and I was working with Jim and Jesse, and and he and I and, and I became closer with uh, with Keith than I did with Ricky. Of course, I knew Ricky also, right. uh, but uh, we Ricky and I became much closer friends friends later on, you know. Right. But uh, Keith and I, we got to talking out on the road somewhere, and he and I, and Jimmy Goodrow, we kind of put our heads together and decided we wanted to form a band. Form a band, okay. And uh, and we did, you did, and we did. And uh, I remember we met up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, for uh, to to put the band together. And uh, we got there and uh, we put the band together. We went into to Rome Studios up there and we just turned a little two track tape on and we recorded four or five things, just real rough. You know, I mean, there, mm -hmm. of course, I treasure them. And uh, and then we I think we played one little gig. And then Keith and I saw that Glenn Campbell was going to be in town at the Ohio State Fair. And he was a huge fan of Glenn, just like I was. And okay. so we went out to the fairgrounds to see Glenn. And uh, the story gets quite long. I don't know if we got time enough in this segment to finish the story, but uh, I wind up uh, meeting Larry McNeely, and uh, one thing leads to another. He wants to pick, and I mean, I can tell the whole story if you want. You just have to tell me how much time we got in this segment. Did but, you have uh, any sense that Keith Whitley had the talent that would emerge later? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Keith was a great singer. He was a great singer then. He was. Uh, I mean, you could tell. I mean, you know, you're not you're yeah. not sitting around thinking about, oh man, yeah, he's going to be a big star one day, or he's right. not thinking that. We're just playing music, you know, yeah. just enjoying being together, having fun. I mean, we went to the the fair that night just to hear Glenn Campbell, and we're blown right. away, you know. And then we went out to the Midway, goofed around, and then we run into Larry McNeely. And the next day, I wind up getting a job with Glenn Campbell. So, Glenn Campbell, it you know, it's just, Carl kind of Jackson's with us. Work. Paul Jackson's with us, and, and we're going to be right back as we continue this Nashville and Parts Unknown edition of Dialogue here at E-Plus TV. Welcome back to this special Nashville and Parts Unknown set up by Willie X. Evans with us here at E-Plus TV 6 on Dialogue, and our guest is Carl Jackson. If you're just joining us, you need to go back and get catch us on replay for sure, because we've, we've been all around the South and the world and everything else with Jim and Jesse and Glenn Campbell and Keith Whitley no and everybody else. Hey, in his, in Steve, his, uh, this, is a, this is a perfect time to cement that invite that Larry Cordell gave us to the <laughs> Right. Come on up and spend a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I'll join in with that. That's all right. Good. <laughs> that, that's good. Call one thing, and, and like I said, we could we explore all this, and of course, and you you can see Carl on the when they replay the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hours, the Glenn Campbell Show. They're all out there in different places, and uh, they show up here on on television with us on occasion as well. Here at e you know, I I have to jump in there just to, just to yeah. briefly. I, I there's a lot of video of me and Glenn out there, a lot, a lot. Yeah. But believe it or not, and and a lot of people get confused because Larry and I kind of wore our hair the same way back then, and when I had hair, you know. Uh, but uh, Larry McNeely was was on the Good Time Hour, and I took Larry's place uh, in 1972. The Good Time okay. Hour had just gone off the air. It all gone, gone off, okay. So I actually was never on the Good Time Hour, although people, a lot of people think I was because okay. Larry and I, I mean, like I say, we wore our hair a bit alike, and, yeah. we, and we played a lot of chromatic banjo and stuff. And But uh, I was on a lot of TV with Glenn after that, so that's yeah, how okay. I kind of get, but uh, yeah, people well, automatically go to the Good Time I, Hour. You know, Willie, you know, if it, it was us, we'd say, we just not say, yeah. 
That's me. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Sometimes you remember when Ray Burnett, they, 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 they went to Europe with Scotty Moore and they were asking Elvis stories and, and Ray said, well, I wasn't really, I came to Sun later. You know, I wasn't there. And, 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 uh, Scotty Moore said, Raver, that's not what they want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes I'll tell you, people, are, they'll, they'll go, no, 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 no. I saw you on the good time. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. Start arguing. You were too. I, I saw it. That's good. You <laughs> became involved with a project about Mark Twain. What was that project and how did that come about? It's a project called Mark Twain Words and Music, and it tells his life story in words and music. It's narrated by Jimmy Buffett, Garrison Keillor, and wow. Clint Eastwood. Wow. And there's a you know there's narration and song narration song narration song it was a it was a joy to do a lady named cindy lovell she was the director of the mark twain home museum in hannibal missouri at, at the time and we were childhood friends uh we, we became friends when i was with jim and jesse wrote letters back and forth to each other and she contacted me and um, uh, the hundredth anniversary of mark twain's passing was coming up and she asked me if I would consider producing a project to honor him. And I thought it was just a great idea. And so we looked for songs and we wrote songs, you know, to work for the project and then just got a multitude of top notch artists to be on the to be on the record. And it was it was a, it was a joy to do. It was a Is labor. It available? Is it, do they still market that in, Han in Hannibal? Uh Oh yeah, it's it's still available. It, it's, it's actually on Jimmy Buffett, Jimmy Buffett's label, Mailboat. Okay. And, uh, it, it's still available and uh, wow. very, very, very proud. It's a double CD set. It's about two hours long. It's perfect driving material. Okay. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of that project. Okay. What are the projects you want people to know about, Carl, with which you've been oh, involved? Well, I mean, you know, I mentioned briefly the, uh, the Live and Love and Losing project, which uh, won a couple of Grammys back in 2003. Uh, that, was, that was also a joy to do. Uh, a tribute to Ira and Charlie was, you know, I love those guys very much too. love their harmony singing and their songwriting. You know, it was, it was amazing. That was another multi-artist. I've got, I kind of been in a mode of, of doing a few of those, you know, I okay. did that. And I also did a project called orthophonic joy, which is, uh, it was a, it was a tribute to the 1927 Bristol sessions once okay. again with, with big artists, you know, Brad Paisley and mm -hmm. oh gosh, just on and on people uh, paying tribute to those original uh you know the big bang of country music that yeah. happened in 1927 i have not been to that museum and i, I want to go you know it's i great. hear really good things about it it's a great museum it's really yeah. well done yeah, really I, well done that's, that's what i hear it and people that are not familiar with a lot of aspects of this music as you say that that is the big bang of of country music those those recording sessions and and yeah. i'm glad that, that museum came into existence because Nashville had kind of taken over all that. And there's, a, there's that special story up there in those mountains. Absolutely. You can see it has to be told. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, I mean, that's where it all, that's where it all started there with Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, you know, and uh, some, so many great songs that were, were on those original sessions. You know? Everyone that I talk to that's, that's in this business, that's been in the music business some way, it's, it's like, there's no planning any of this. Like you're talking about a childhood friend winds up being in Hannibal, Missouri and, it yeah. all just, it's just this odd mix of, of momentum events. One thing leads to another and, and all kinds of unexpected ways. Like I say, you go to the fair and you wind yeah. up working with Glenn Campbell. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, it's like, a, I mean, I had, I had uh, either four or five different classmates sign my yearbook, my senior yearbook saying, see you on Glenn Campbell one day or, I'll, I'll, I'll see you on Glenn Campbell. I know you're going to, you'll be performing with Glenn Campbell, uh, literally, because okay. the good time hour was huge when I, you okay. know, in, in right. 1971, when I graduated. Right. So, uh, and of course, I didn't think that would ever happen. And just like you say, you know, Keith and I, we, we see this ad in the paper, and man, we're going to see Glenn Campbell. You know, we yeah. got an opportunity to see Glenn Campbell. So we did. And the next day he hires me, you know, just that's, that's God's hand. You know, okay. that's all, that's all you can say about that. Yeah. Did he ever tell you why? What was that? Did he ever tell you why he hired you? I mean, it's like, cause you're what, well, you're, you're still a young, but you're a young man, right? Well, I mean, I, I want to think he hired me because he loved my playing. I yeah. remember I went in, you know, I'd already, I, Larry and I had, Larry had asked me to get together with him. We, we had met and uh, he'd asked me to get together and do some picking together right. the next day after we met, they were there two days at the fair. And I, I said, Oh, happy to. So I came over the next day and we, we picked back and forth, but I, 
Larry kept asking me if I could play certain things. You know, he, can you play this song? Can you play this song? Can you play this? You know, and I didn't really know what he was doing. And then all of a sudden he looks over at me and he goes, would you like to have this job? And I went, well, yeah, but what are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm just, I'm tired of traveling and um, I've been looking for somebody that could replace me and you could do it. Wow. And he said, he said, give me just a minute. And he leaves me and he goes to the next trailer over, which were the dressing rooms, you know, at, at the Ohio State Fair. And he comes back about, you know, two or three minutes later and he says, come with me. And we walk in this, the trailer next door and there sits Glenn Campbell, my, you know, my hero, you know, and uh, he puts me through the same hoops, you know, it's like, can you play this? Can you play this? Can you play this? Can you play Little Rock Getaway? And I'm like, yeah, you know, so I played it for him on banjo, you know, and then he goes, can you play guitar? I said, yeah, a little bit. And at the time, I mean, I, I basically knew everything that Glenn did because I loved him so much, you know, wow. and, uh, so then he, he, and he asked me if I could play the claw, which was a Jerry Reed tune. And I said, yeah. And he said, play it for me. So I played him the claw and he looked over at me and he said, how much would you like to make? That's exactly what he said. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, a million bucks, you know, and with that, that little 18 year old smile, you know, or whatever, you know, and he, he laughs and he says, you go home, you get your stuff together. I'll have my business manager, Stan, call you and uh, wow. we get things worked out. And so he's- Glenn he Campbell, it, and many people don't realize this, was an extraordinary studio musician had been on so many things. I mean, pickers pick, and they know how people, you know, if you, yeah. if you picked and impressed him, that was the real deal. I mean, he knew it, because not it, many. It, it, uh, he, was, he was one of the greatest of all oh, time. Wow. It meant, wow. meant the world, and uh, to, uh, for, to be able to go and work with him. Right. I learned a lot. Oh, if people want to follow, if people want to follow what you do now, what's the best way to do that? Well, you can see a lot of videos uh, and stuff up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. YouTube uh, yes. My wife, she runs a, she runs a YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's Robin and Carl Jackson, or Carl Jackson and Robin Jackson, or okay. whatever. If you, if you do a search, you, you right. can just search. Please subscribe. And there's tons of videos up okay. there from some from the old days. I think there's some up there with even yeah. with Jim and Jesse. And there's a lot right. of stuff from Glenn. And there's a lot of stuff okay. from Monday nights at the station. Right. Excellent. A real pleasure to get to know you. Have this time together. I appreciate the time so much. I enjoyed it very much. Good, right, good to see you guys. Good, good, good to see you soon. Right. Thanks to Willie X. Evans. Thanks to Carl Jackson. Thanks to you for being with us. Stay with us here at E-Plus TV 6 because this is the place where the dialogue continues. <laughs>